How are we? My guest today is Bernard Leong. Bernard is currently the Group Chief Digital and Information Officer at a Singapore construction conglomerate. But also, for the focus of today's conversation, he is the founder of Analyze Asia, a weekly podcast on tech, business, and media that features notable industry players and thought leaders all across Asia. And more importantly, one of my favorite podcasts. So in this conversation, we cover the podcast scene within Asia, why podcasts are harder to make in Asia Pacific compared to the US, and solving podcast distribution and monetization problems. So selfishly, I learned a ton, but there's plenty to take away for you too as a listener. So please enjoy my conversation with Bernard Leon. Cool. Bernard, thank you so much for coming on. Um, big one for me, especially because Analyze Asia is kind of the barometer that I am for and what my I want my podcast to be. But I think a fun point maybe to start today is with your background. So could you tell me a little bit about your background in theatre during your PhD days at Cambridge and how that initially helped you with making the podcast and its influence? Mm. I think um, just to give everyone a very quick background, I'm currently working as a group chief digital and information officer in the Singapore construction conglomerate. Uh, prior to that, I actually worked with uh, Airbus and, as their head of drone services for Asia Pacific. I also ran the China business and also with uh, Amazon Web Services as their head of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, for ASEAN. Then uh, back even before that, I actually made my career with uh, as the uh, chief digital officer for Singapore. They also run their retail business as well. So my background, right? Uh, but with such a very, very non-linear background, I actually did my... PhD in theoretical physics. Then you must be wondering, you talk about my theater background. Yeah. And my theater background actually came when I was in high school. I actually studied for the Trinity speech and drama. I think I was about grade five. Uh, that was the last two. I actually did uh, script, drama. Some of my friends have gone on to become playwrights in the Singapore scene. But I have actually never known to be in the front. It was actually made to be doing sound likes and I think my last job in NUS when I did a theater play for my uh, hostel, you know, our college, they call it, in Cambridge, was actually an assistant producer. It's only when I went to the UK, I became a full producer. Uh, and then, now what the theater taught me, it taught me a lot about the stage uh, because I was also a trained actor in speech and drama. So I was able to focus a lot on thinking about the lights, sound, and how the stage is being presented. So... When you think about doing a podcast, um, it's an audio product, right? So you need to think about how does it make your podcast stand out? How do how does the way you project your sound, your enunciation? Uh, strangely, when I first started at Analyze Asia, I actually went to a professional coach to get my enunciation correct. These are the things that people don't talk about, right? Uh, why? Because I am Singaporean. I have a Singapore, Singaporean accent. And the thing is that uh, for American listener or even a European listener for that matter, they will need a little bit of difficulty in understanding me. So that background came to helping me to think about the podcast. And also it also helps me to think about how to set the stage for the people that you interview. How do I think about interviewing? I always like to tell people, I think of an interview like a chess game. There is the before, which I have to prepare, like you do source questions, source the guests, put the questions in place. Then there is the interview itself. Um, then there is the reaction bit where how do you ask a follow-up? Because you like you, you want me to talk all the time, right? Being <laughs> sitting on the other opposite of the position. And then there's the post, which is the production, where there's actually a lot more work uh, that needs to be done for Asian podcasts as compared to any US podcast out there. Can I drill down on that last bit? Why do you think there's more work required? I think first of all, uh, one of the uh, one of the open secrets on Analyze Asia is that I always tell people forty percent of my audience comes from the U.S. market. But Same what people here. do not know, what people do not know, is that when I invite a non-native English speaker to my podcast, think of a mainland Chinese, or even think of someone who a Japanese who is not very fluent in English, a lot of the work is actually done on editing the speaker because they speak in broken parts. So one of the things that you really need to do at the sound editing is to make sure that all the empty spaces is being cut off during the editing process so that they sound very fluent or at least they can put together a sentence. I think this is the underappreciated stuff. I usually have the a Chinese speaker came to me and said, Bernard, how do you make my voice sound so good on your podcast? And my friends were like wondering. 
So I think the question of um, trying to make yourself listenable when you when talk about the audio quality, I spent, before I'm now having a team behind me to do all this work, I actually have done the editing myself for about up to before I took a break for two and a half years. Um, that editing process, even my wife is like, why are you cutting this? I was like, I cut things like, um, uh, that's not enough. I even cut things like um, any speaker, if you think about the way they speak, they would like to uh, put in filler words like, I think, I believe, sort of, you know, I eliminate, eliminate more, most of them because I'm dealing with an American audience. They want things to be crips. They want things to listen to easily. And funny that you said this, right? I actually have even my own audience coming to me saying that uh, I only spent 20 minutes on your podcast because you cut down all the words that doesn't, I can't hear from a typical native Asian speaker. So I think some people do realize the effect of what a high quality podcast means. And I think by putting a lot of thought, and that also comes back, back to the theater background piece, right? Where you need to figure out how to be able to present that uh, interview, that process of conversation between two people in the best possible way possible. And I use a lot of my editing skills and I used to think about it. And then when I start imposing my standards on now my editorial team, at first they were like, why do you need to throw away all these things? And then I was telling them, look, you are, you are thinking from a point of view of an Asian speaker, but I'm thinking of a point of view of an American speaker. That's where my audience really is. Yep, fair point. And that's the post side, but for the interview style, um, you've mentioned Charlie Rose as a role model for your interview style. Mm. So could you tell me about his influence on you and how you conduct interviews? So uh, the unfortunate part of it, even as a role model, um, I heard that he was also being castigated because of the Me Too movement. But I think um, let's not focus on the person, but focus on the interview style. I think the important part on how Charlie Rose interviews his guests is to start the conversation in a very easy friendly and non-confrontational way. I think one of the best interviews he, he has ever done, and I think um, the American media has uh, always talked about how competitive uh, the late uh, Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, speaks. And that interview, if you watch how Charlie Rose get him into the conversation, it was very friendly, very slow, but it managed. he managed to, within that entire conversation, encapsulate some of the most difficult topics of his uh, prime ministership and some of the controversial things that are uh, done that he, he, has, he has as well. But he, he was able to pull him into the conversation and, and just make it uh, interesting and not being... Uh, the guest is actually the main subject of the day, not him being the main subject of the day. So when I think about interviewing my guests, I think the most recent one where I interviewed uh, Carl Davis from Three Arrows Capital, I had my own positions on the whole crypto crash, but I didn't talk about it during that interview. That interview, Carl was my subject and I let him talk. And he actually said more than what I thought he would have said. And that was that was the, the way I think about a conversation. And that's why I learned a lot from the way how Charlie Rose uh, interviews his guests. And actually he used to listen to his uh, audio interviews because I was trying to pick a style where I'm, that is most suitable for myself. Uh, because I'm not a confrontational person. So I tend to use it in a way where I, I need to be able to be friendly and bring the person into the conversation or maybe even Kara Sisha, who everybody knows her through the uh, record and now her uh, podcast, her new one after Sway. She says, just let them talk. You don't need to do anything. Just let them talk. And they will talk. Yeah, open-ended questions is the, yeah, the key factor for me. Um, and from that same article, you've mentioned that if I correct me if I'm wrong, the Shokunin method for how you plan mm. to run the podcast. So could you explain what that is? And is that still the case about how the podcast is run? Yeah. So um, the Japanese has a system called the Shokunin. It means a craftsman, being a craftsman. So when you think about, uh, when I talk about building a very high quality audio podcast, um, so I uh, is to be able to make sure that the podcast is done with the right uh, sound quality. I do my best. Uh, there are days where my guests may not be in a very convenient location and do the interview. Um, then I also focus a lot about how 
of the workflow is. Okay, I started with a very basic workflow. Um, so the thing is that I can only spend five hours on the on each episode. Uh, because I have my day job, which is a very demanding job, and then I have my three kids now as well, and so I needed that five hours, and I broke that five hours into units. So it starts off from sourcing the guests. So there will be emails, but I also did a CRM on them. So that what for what CRM is is customer relationship management. Think of every guest as a customer, and then after that there will be a back and forth. And then there will be a set of questions so um, that we will pre-agree on. And then after that, uh, we'll go into the actual recording. Uh, upon completion of the recording, it goes into production and then into publication and then through distribution. Where a lot of the, just now when you were asking me about what is the work that uh, Asian startups need to do, a pretty big weakness for all Asian podcasts, including mine, is actually in distribution. Uh, so I, I can talk about that a little bit more later uh, yeah. when, we, when, we, when we go deeper into some of the things that have changed. But I think this is some of the things that we really think about getting their workflow. Now, what I also do is that because I have a very dedicated workflow, I try to minimize the amount of time I do my work to the point where some of the things I start automating them. I'll give you one, one, one of the biggest chunk of the entire workflow was actually editing the podcast. That takes me the most time. Uh, typically, it's about three to five hours. Actually, there's a heuristic. So for people who do not know, if you are in theater, you know this uh, trade secret. If it's a text, it takes you less than a, a millisecond to edit. For an audio, it takes you one times three the amount of time, meaning for every minute of audio you record, you need three minutes to edit. And then for every video, it's one times 10, which is for every minute of video, you need to do 10 minutes of editing. And hence, this, this is the part that I think um, most of my podcast, most of the podcasters I've observed, I, I see a lot of my Asian podcasts uh, as friends because uh, one of the interesting feature of doing podcasting is a non-zero-sum game, uh, which, is, which is a big surprise. I like text-based new sites or even video, I think it's also a non-zero sum game. So it, the key difference of that, trying to get the, the editing correct, I think is, is one of the big issues I see across all podcasts in Asia as well. And yeah, it's a hard thing to learn too. Like me starting from scratch took me a long time to get it figured out. And even um, extension to that is tools. So you've been running the podcast for over eight years now. So how have the tools changed over time? Um, and yeah. Yeah. So I will tell you some trade secrets here. Yeah. So I started using GarageBand, which is the simplest editing tool. I know some of the uh, other producers of the podcast, they use uh, Adobe Edition or Audacity, which I think these are the common ones. Uh, lately, I have shifted into a tool which is very useful. It's called Descript. What is so beautiful about this script? In fact, this is very ironic. I actually recommend to uh, Charles Anderson from Typers Podcast to first, and then he used it for two years and he told me, this is the best tool you have ever recommended to me. And I still haven't used it. So until when I came back, the first 20, 20 hours of starting to do the workflow of starting the, restarting the podcast again, I spent a, a good chunk of, I think, uh, an hour or two to do the script and then I discover it's a great tool. Okay, what why makes what makes this script a good tool? Imagine editing your audio file just like the way you edit a word document. Mm. So think of the days where I used to have, in fact, in 2015 when I first started, because I'm pretty uh well skilled in products, I was thinking is I actually did ask Andrew Ng, who was a uh the former expert in, in AI, foremost expert in AI. And I asked him, is there a way where, you know, I can use all the audio files. I learned everybody's mm, uh, sort of, and then start doing a press a button and then auto delete. He said it's actually doable in AI. And the script has that feature. So that one thing that took me probably of the three hours I spent on editing, uh, that's a good chunk of probably at least an hour, 33.3% of trying to eliminate filler words has suddenly become a button. Wow. So you can, in this script, you can do 
delete all ums and ahs. You can delete all repeat words. Okay. But then yeah. you still need to, you can still need, sometimes the filler words may be a transition. So you have to be very careful. So you have to go and listen to that part and then you cut it properly so that you don't lose the transition as well. So it's a constant um, debate between me and my editor sometimes about what is supposed to be cut. Yeah. And can you normalize audio in Descript as well and all the audio yes, levels? Yes, there's a studio format. So the good news is that when I first recommended the tool, that was like four or five years ago. Now it's an extremely good product, not just for audio, but it's also for video as well. So I think that's the one big change on that. Okay, microphones, right? Uh, I started using a pretty simple microphone, which is the one on my MacBook Pro. And then I use... Uh, uh, I think there's a Boss Audio one that I think I recommended in that article that I wrote, but I've changed to now a Yeti Studio uh, microphone that came about when my other co-host, Carol, recommended to me. When she was my producer and we swapped positions for the two years I was away. Then for video, I started to use a Logitech CR209, I think. It's, it's, the, it's the video format. And then I think most of the other things like, oh, publishing has also changed for me. So for a long time, uh, Analyze Asia was on WordPress. I have recently changed it. I think when I came back, that was also the other first 20 hours. I swapped my website from WordPress into Ghost, uh, Ghost Pro. Mm. So I went from a self-hosting because I know how to host websites itself to now letting someone do the hosting for me. Uh, hosting a podcast, I think best is to do it on lip sync uh i use lip sync fun too. fact i used to be do blurberry okay i will tell you why i made the swap it's not because i don't like blurberry i like the guys there problem was blurberry was banned in china oh wow okay okay and if you have a 10 percent market in china you got a big problem yeah <laughs> right so 10% of my audience come from China. So I actually went to Burberry and he said, I don't know why I got banned. I'm like, okay, fine. I have to move. So these are some of the things that people don't realize that's very, very important. So I think in terms of the distribution tools, a lot is in using the standard social media. But I think for Analyze Asia, the two channels where I find most effective for my audience is LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I actually haven't think about any community engagement, but I can talk about it more because uh, I have a I think over this past one year, three months after I came back, I've started to take a deeper look into what the future looks like, and I'm starting to do a lot more experiments on things that I think I can share about a yeah. bit later. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get into community distribution, um, you've touched on a couple times already, but do you want to talk about? when you took the break from the podcast and maybe why and the story there? So the story, the official statement is that I, I yes, I, my third daughter, my third kid just came out, uh, Estella. And uh, I actually have three kids by then and I'm a pretty um, uh, hands-on, like seven to nine. I do not use any device and just spend time with them. I think the workload uh, that I, st- I I was in Amazon during that time, so it was very, very uh, tiring. And hence, I needed to take a break for a while. But I think the good news for that was that that two and a half years of break, uh, and because I was being subjected to Amazon training, I've come back with a much more fresher perspective. I think the insist on high standards is definitely there if you, are, if you know the... Uh, Amazon uh, 16 leadership principles now not 14 you will know that the the insist on high standards is one of the most important but the other thing I learned was that I once I have finished the Amazon tenure it has given me the confidence and the tools to be able to figure out how to grow a company from a 50 million to a billion it's probably the last piece on my uh, collection of tools to get to is sort of how to think about scaling as such. But I think tools are tools, right? So if you try to apply the same set of tools, you can also apply the same set of tools to your podcast. So one of the things that really after during that break, I do miss interviewing people. So yes, I do. Okay. Um, 
but it was also good because I took a step back. Kara and I switched roles. She was a host, but I was the editor. So I started to think a lot about um, what are the tools being used and how to think about publication as well. And then there were a lot of things I saw that needs to be improved from being a full-time producer than being a host plus producer as such. Yeah. So what happened was that I decided that when I come back, these are the 20 changes I'm going to make. So the first being the script, the website, CMS, because I'm thinking of a subscription model in the future. So all these changes that I've made across this year and some of the experiments I've just started with is basically to help me to set the foundations for the next step of the evolution of this podcast. I think uh, very, very funny, people always uh, make fun of Amazonians. We talk about the nature of day one. Um, after eight years of this podcast, I still think of, I'm still on, at day one. And I still think that we are, I'm still very far away from what I think the best podcast in the world is. And some of the podcasts that I start off at the same time, I know the people in the US, they have actually grown into full actual business. Uh, one interesting one, which I actually I'm very thankful for them because they actually promote my podcast a lot and they use my podcast as a reference material was Acquired. Oh, well, I think yeah. a lot of people listen to Acquired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, funny, if you listen to a Tencent episode, they actually mentioned my name and my podcast and they told them, I was the one who referred to them. Uh, what was, there was a Chinese book uh, on Tencent's uh, history. And they actually managed to find someone who translated the book in English, uh, oh. the summary. So they, they were able to use some of the data there on there. And I actually know the founders. I go to, I'm a choir member, so I talk to them a lot. And I find that they have, because of, I think the the relative geographies that the US and I mean, Asia Pac, I find that they, uh, they their road to monetization, while the hard work is all the same, but the returns they got is actually far bigger than what I thought Analyze Asia should have been. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about monetization? Because um, I've got from an old mm. article as well. He said, this was in 2018, but he said he mm. hadn't taken mm. sponsorship yet because the advertising yep. networks were just not focused on that medium. Has that changed? Mm. I've seen ads on the podcast recently, but yeah, how do you approach monetization and sponsors? And yeah. Mm. I think the, the first thing is that if you take up sponsorship, let's say you take affiliate ads from LipSync or any of the podcast platform out there, or even like your mid-rolls, basically you have to take the US ads. So that's number one. Now, if you think of Analyze Asia's positioning, you're no different from dealing with a Recode, a Tim Ferriss show, a Quiet. So you're no differentiation there. So even you give a promo code, your chances of conversion is actually far less as compared to all the other podcasters in the US. So even if you have the audience, but you do not have the, if you're sharing the same audience with the US podcast, you're in a very, advertising will never work for you. I think I've seen that very, very early. So what I did was I just test run a few ads uh, because my, my wife's startup. So it's easier for me to figure out how to think about it. But, and so this question, that's the problem number one. Problem number two is that, um, Podcast as a medium is not very popular in our part of the world. I think the question then you have to start asking is, if you want a monetization strategy, should you go for the US market, which I've been thinking a lot on, or should you focus on your local market? If you're going to focus on your local market, then certain strategies has to change. And I'm beginning to think about those changes that I want to make that actually move towards that. So that's, that's the first thing about uh, advertising. The second problem is that the sponsorship piece, right? It's actually very, very difficult because I think local companies do not know how to use the podcast medium. It's not about just reading your ad. It's actually more about like, can I take your ad and be a user? I'll give you an example, right? If I say, I use one of the products of somebody um, selling um, snacks, a subscription as a service snacks, and I'm a user of that service. It will be far, far easier for me to sell, give a promo code and people can purchase and even talk to the founder because it's a startup. Or I could be using one of the apps, uh, for example, maybe a Grab or GoTo app, you know, where I can talk as a customer 
as well as an ad. I think that's something that nobody has tried it. I think the only closest company that I've seen the ads, but the ads didn't appear in Asia podcast, but it's in the US podcast is Stash Away. Okay. They actually leverage a lot of their advertising uh, by geography locking. So a lot of the business podcasts I listen to has a Stash Away ad. I think only if you are in the US because I did a VPN and I downloaded the episode in a separate uh, channel and I realized the ads were different. So that Joe targeting piece is not there yet. And there, and then there is this question about SEO in podcasts. Uh, let me just tell you, I tried podcast consultants to talk about SEO. After spending 200 US dollars, I told myself there's no such thing called podcast SEO. It's just crap. The only thing you need to do is to do transcript. But the problem with everyone also in the region doing this is that they run an AI to transcribe the content. But because we are not native English speakers, we ended up having a very low quality transcript. So the question then is, what differentiates reading your transcript and listening to you? So I think people are not thinking, dive very deep into the rudiments of that. And I think that that is also the reason why sponsorship don't work as well on there. So I think these are the, the key factors in terms of thinking about the model. The irony is, my podcast is growing, okay? So I reached my first million in five years, all right? It was a lot of effort. So to tell everybody how I did my stats is I count the downloads, the plays from every major podcast uh, platform. So that's your Apple Podcasts, your Spotify, your SoundCloud, because those were the three that I used. On top of that, I also count the lip sync downloads. Now your lip sync downloads are not indicative of your actual downloads. The reason is that a lot of people do not realize this. When Spotify takes the first download from you, it tries to cache. So if you, I've seen my actual Spotify numbers versus my lip sync Spotify numbers, it's gone by at least three to four orders on my YouTube. Oh, wow. So, so, so the, that, so even the, the stats is the question, right? And then Chartable will try to chart you according to your interview. So they, they, if you are a niche player like myself and you know who your audience are, I can talk a little bit more about my, who my actual audience are. And I only discover them through uh, accident or through people writing to me. But the actual growth rate was there. So the second million, that means when Carol was on the seat, was achieved in uh, June 2021. So it means that for the same two and a half years, the second million comes in the sec in, in two and a half years. So you're half the speed. And the reason why that has happened is because if you are as if you live as long as I do in the podcast scene for eight years, you have a big back catalog. And your big back uh, catalog and also taking your podcast title is a compounding effect. Yeah. So One thing, yeah, I've sorry. actually compounded. The second million is actually achieved by the compounding of the first million. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'm reaching my third million in March 2023. Wow. And there's half the speed, half, sorry, half the amount of time, twice the speed of my second million. Unreal. So so think think of that, right? And yet I still can't monetize. Oh man. <laughs> what hope do I have? <laughs> So, so the question, so so which which comes back to the question of what can we monetize? Um, I had a four hundred episode with Carol, my co-host, uh, who's based in China, and we had a pretty, uh, honest heart to heart talk in front of all our audience, and we talk about all the different ways we can monetize the podcast. And I'm thinking very very hard about it. Um, I think there are a few things that needs to change. Uh, so the the and I can go down a little bit more on it. But I think the, there are just some things that we need to think about changing, like the way how we should think about advertising. Uh, and definitely we need subscriptions. I'm pretty sure I have a thousand true fans. I have never talked to them before. So in, in that fashion, so I'm going to try to reach out to them. And then the other thing I need to think about is how do I do community management, which is something I have, have never really focus on because I spent a lot of time producing each episode, but I never think about 
how to grow my own communities as well. Yeah, it's a tough one too because there's just so many different things. And even sponsorships, it sounds good in theory, but I was talking to John from Asianometry and he's like, it's so much more work than what I thought it would be too. Mm. But there is a uh, different type of advantage if you're in Asia. But if you can produce a good podcast, but in a different language, say a Bahasa, a Chinese, or even Japanese, you may be able to um, go past what I call the download rates because your content is actually interesting. So there are actually a couple of podcasts that you and I may not talk about, but they're actually doing very well. On such. I know a, a pretty well-known uh, Japanese tech podcast where they monetize because the tech podcast is in Japanese. So, so this is where I think, um, this is one of the things I'm thinking how to fix uh, my podcast currently goes because I can speak Mandarin. So, mm. so, so, so question mark for me is should I do a Chinese version of Analyze Asia? Uh, Carol also can speak Mandarin as well. So great, we, there, there, is a way, there is a way for us, right? So I think the, the question of language localization is one big one that uh, you can get advantage. But I think subscription is the way to go. Um, community management is the way to go. And good news for all Asia podcasters here, Web3 is global. There's NFTs. Why are we not thinking about it? Because a lot of the NFT companies are actually based here in Asia Pacific. Uh, even worse, it's based in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Why are we not thinking about this hard enough? So... I think that the 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 one big change you have maybe before 2019 is that the tools for monetization have changed. And I think we're actually right at the very, very early cups of that change. We're not even at the like what I call the the beginning yet. I think we're still at that um inflated expectations if you think of the Ghana hype cycle yeah. for NFTs. But I think once the hype is broken. Which I was, I which I think is the, is the next year or so. Then I think that there is going to be a, a clear monetization mode to thinking about the pod, how to monetize uh, content in Asia. Mm. So with the podcast specifically and for subscriptions, what do you think you should offer? Because I've toyed with it, and it's like, do I put transcripts behind a paywall? Do I offer extra episodes? Have you what? Like, what have you thought about in that? Okay, I'm I'm not going to be. Um, very innovative in the membership part, but I think I'm going to do a very basic membership model to focus on two things. One is uh, community management. So for Discord, I'm actually going to be investing in bringing a proper community manager into Analyze Asia to help me to man manage the community, get the feedback from, from, the user, from the users who are the listeners of the podcast. The second is that uh, for if you subscribe as a member, on Analyze Asia, you will get to see selected transcripts for free. But the for full transcript, I'm going to be imposing that you will pay a subscription fee. Where the subscription fee is, the number is, I don't know, mm. but my sense is somewhere between five to 10. So Acquire has done this uh, model, but they also add podcast episodes, which is something I'm also thinking about. But I think to do this, uh, monetization for memberships. You have to be very delicate on that. I don't. I don't need to go full steam to provide everything or everything. I just need to give the right set of uh, privileges that can allow me to experiment, iterate, and invent and wonder mm. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Not good so 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 I think yeah. So from there you slowly pick it up, and then you probably see maybe I might have a master plan. And just say, okay, let's just do these three things correct. If you do these three things correct, then maybe these are the metrics I think we will grow by. And that's how we, yeah, you can do that. I think, yeah. I think it's, I think people should try. I don't think it's, it looks dead for us in this part of the world, but the nature of telling the story is also changing as well. Yeah. yeah and I suppose for you, if you're so conscious of, you, you have a day job, you have family, it's yeah, not adding too much extra work on your plate as well. So, mate, you're doing an amazing job. I'm, yeah, so envious. Yeah, I used to tell my editor, I'm paying you with all the Bitcoin trading money that I made. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you find a podcast editor? Like, how did you did you go through multiple different people before you settled on one and your style? Or yeah, I gone through referrals. I tried different people. Carol is probably the first person, and she also became the host of the show. Mm. 
Uh, but of course, she also moved on. She's now in a different career and she definitely can host a show uh, in her own merit as well. Mm. Um, so I found a pretty good editor. He's based in Seoul. He's American, so he understands the context, how he will ask me questions. He will focus a lot on how I should do the next podcast, how to improve. And we do a lot of things like every now and then I'll check through my audio specifications. And it was also good that he was also an audio host as well. Mm -hmm. So he knew how to guide me into thinking about that process. So it's a lot through referral. Um, the other things like transcript, you probably can look through Upwork or maybe even to other, uh, there used to be Fiverr, but Fiverr's quality is very lousy. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't uh, encourage that. But what I will also suggest is that whatever you want to get people to do for you, even from transcripts, I actually read the transcripts myself and actually do the editing. So if you saw the one I did for Three Arrows, uh, I did get a professional transcription work done. Mm. And then on top of it myself, I have to go in and actually re-edit to the level that I considered as high quality, something that I'm willing to read. Mm. So that's the first time I actually showed a transcript product. I'm deliberately telling my audience that I'm really thinking about this, but I'm not going to do the AI transcribe model where you just see a bunch of trash, garbage in, garbage out. I'm going to be spending some time to that. And what will you be paying for is that quality work that actually helps you to make sense of that. I mean, the Bloomberg's out there, they, they, they actually sell the transcripts as part of their trans, uh, subscription package. But they also do it in a very high quality. So you have to think about, I think it's, 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 it's unfortunate or fortunate. We are hobbies. I think you and I, we ran our podcast. We started as hobbies. Um, when we think to take it to the next step or we have to become more and more professional. So even for, even talking about transcripts, I, I don't take it lightly. It's not, it's not, I mean, I know a lot of my fellow Asian podcasters do that, okay? I see their transcripts as well. And even sometimes my wife is like bugging me, why aren't you doing your transcripts? I'm like, no, the quality is just not that. Mm. If you just go and read it yourself, Sometimes the AI don't transcribe the words properly for Asian speaker. So mm. let's not kid ourselves as well. You're not going to read after probably three, four paragraphs because the, the, the AI transcribe is not working very well. Doing more like thinking. AI, in, yeah. You, whether you're doing ref or descript as well, even descript doesn't do very well for uh, Asian native voices, which makes it interesting on that. Yeah. I think my... Um bootstrapped method is I get through AWS their transcripts are like two dollars and it same thing garbage in garbage out but then I go through myself and fix it all up so there's probably like 10% yeah. corrections so yeah so but you are also a good native speaker right so it also makes it easier for you whereas when you try to start interviewing the actual Asian speakers because they are non-native with the exception of Singaporean but I still have Americans telling me that English is not my native language so I'm not going to oh. have a debate with them over this but <laughs> But that's the point, right? So the mm. accented speakers are at a disadvantage here mm. still. Yeah. No, there's a few crazy different things that pop up in trend. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know what to look for now when I get the AI transcription back. So, mm. yeah. Um, so you touched on at the start of the conversation about distribution. Is that changing for you and approaching to that? Distribution is the one that's the hardest to crack. And the reason why it's hard to crack is because of the numbers. When we think about the US podcast versus the Asian podcast, I think we are about two orders of magnitude below. Wow. Oh, yeah. All right. Just, just even for me, uh, being vocally self-critical. So the key of it is to figure out how to distribute your content to get people interested in the fastest way possible. Now, podcast is a long form medium to tell a story. I think there are a few paths to this now. And so, which also have uh, started me on the path of doing something that I've been avoiding for years, which was to do video. Mm. So with video, things have changed a lot. So I think the Carl Davis interview, which I did, was the first of the video podcast, but it won't be the last, where just by taking a few videograms 
and started posting into say a TikTok or YouTube, things have changed. It changes the way how you think about distribution. Uh, funny, you can also use the video distribution to push the audio distribution. So, so I've seen a couple of trends, but these are very, very early trends, but also it depends a lot on who you're interviewing. Mm. So I probably wouldn't do everyone in video. I'm not going to go all video because it doesn't make sense. But I might, what I might do is I'm very selective about who I should put on video and who I should put on audio. Mm. Uh, that also gives me a lot more flexibility. It's number one. Number two, if you're trying to do any regional executives who are on my podcast, chances are you're not going to go video that easily because the entire PR team needs to be sitting onto that call. No way you can do a video like what we are doing. We, in fact, this episode, we can both go into video if we mm. really want to, right? But the nature of how we wanted to get the right video, how do we want to make it work? The, that is something that we have to be a little bit more deliberate. So the the way of telling a story is going to change. I'm not afraid of sharing what I'm doing because I know that there probably wouldn't be one person who's going to get it right. There'll probably be a few people who's going to get it right. And once you can get it right on there, then you can start to create a different discovery mechanism. So, so that's number one. Video is, is distribution number one. Number two is I think the lack of understanding of your audience, which nobody does. So this is a trick I taught uh, uh, Charles when on his podcast. I said, what you should be doing is not keep listening to yourself, is to go to listen to yourself and see what Spotify recommends. Mm. And then start sh asking yourself, who should you be on? Who show you should be on in order to get yourself recommended? across as well. So hacking the recommendation engine. And why do I know this? Because my PhD was in theoretical physics and I do machine learning. I was doing things like identifying mRNA targets in 2003, which yeah. surprisingly today, mRNA targets are being used for mm. vaccines. Mm. So whatever machine learning I know, I know how to hack the algorithms. So I know how Spotify's algorithm works. I used to sell recommendation and <laughs> engines from AWS to, you know, a lot of companies around the region. But the, the, the idea is that you need to know who are listening to your podcast and what other podcasts they listen to. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, it's like, okay, maybe because I'm very reclusive and I don't think a lot about that, but the hacking is correct. You need to be targeted. So there was a period of time I would be very selective and say, okay, I'll go through different podcast for a while and then I let it see and then I will see whether when I go to their podcast is mine the top on their recommendations list if I'm not that means there's two things I learned one the audience is different that's good because it's a better discovery if it's the same then I say shucks we're in trouble because if all these podcasts are all leading back to me then we have a problem because you're not discovering new audience yeah. so even from a very algorithmic way um, the, the beauty of, uh, there was a very good mathematical result that the best results that comes out of a social network is not through the strong links you have within your hub. It's actually through the weak links that you have. Mm, okay. Yeah. So the, the fact that the, in fact, it's the same with even like looking for a job, doing everything. It's actually the, the weak links that you have are the ones that helps you to get to the growth effect faster. So I think for the past few years, when I think about even thinking about how to hack the recommendation engine, I'm also very mindful of, am I touching the same audience who are listening to me? I'm also listening to them. I might as well try someone else who had never known who I am, maybe in a travel site and then, you know, have a different different narrative. So mm. I think understanding that targeting is the second part in distribution that people don't talk about. Yeah. And the beauty of podcasts is we can scale easy. It's all remote now as well. Have you ever thought about doing uh, more in-person interviews or events or, yeah, have you ever thought about that? I've thought about that. Like I said, I have only five hours per episode. True. And most likely with video is probably end up to be 15. Mm. Um, so question mark is then how do I 
create those times. I'm thinking about smaller scale events because I'm trying to figure out a lot more of my audience. I think the before I even get to the physical events, I need to understand my audience better, mm. uh, which I think we never haven't talked about it. No, yeah, I was gonna well. ask. Again, I will tell you a very interesting story. So I realized that almost get near my first million uh, place or downloads or whichever streams that my audience are not the person, are not the people who will go to Apple Podcasts to give me the five-star rating and comments. Mm. Okay, so that's question number one. So who are they? So it turned out that I was pretty lucky when I was hitting um, Airbus as the head of drone services. I was a VP. So I was invited to go to the World Economic Forum in Vietnam to give a talk on drones, okay, about agriculture drones. So very interesting that day, I thought, because it was a very small area. So I think the way how the panels were. So, but then my segment was overflowed on that day. So by the time I finished the thing, it was with JD's head of uh, technology, their CTO, and we were talking about drone services. A few people came out to me. Some of them gave me the business cards and some of the people are very important because the chief of staff was standing right beside them and they walked up to me. One of them being one of the CEOs of the largest petroleum in the region. Go figure who he is. But the first thing he came to me, I was I thought, oh, because you're giving me the card, you must be thinking about doing drone services for your oil pipelines inspection, etc. It turns out that I'm a fan of your show, by the way. How do you how, how do I get onto your show? What? Funny. That's not the only one. Another one was the CEO of the largest one of the large agriculture firms. So, so there I say, hey, I'm a fan of your show, by the way. So I started to realize my actual audience are, are decision makers who wants to get a sense of what is going on, but they look for a pretty high quality podcast mm. and they were trying to figure out. And then, of course, I talk about emails, right? I get emails from hedge funds, from VC funds, institutional funds over the years. Uh, to, to ask me a very, very basic question. Is Lazada real? Is Grab real? Do you actually use this app? Like things that, are, what I think they are, what they're actually doing, they're doing due diligence. Mm. But they see me as their conduit to understand. In fact, mm. one of the founders I recently invested in in a Web3 business, did, oh, uh, by the way, I was in Singapore between this period of time and your podcast was my entry to the market. So oh. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was the founder of Staging Labs, Francois. And he was telling me straight out, I like, I discovered your podcast through trying to make my way to Asia. So I, I've now known who they are. I mean, anecdotally, et cetera. I also get think tanks as well. So uh, one of the things that people do not talk about is also the effects that I don't monetize. What do I get, right? I do get a lot of what I call a personal brand um, as well. For example, I was invited to speak at, uh, I think, at least two Fortune 500 companies in Daimler's Leadership Summit in Singapore. I was there as a keynote speaker for their, by invitation, closed door session. Yeah. I did Caterpillar as well uh, yeah. for their Apex Summit as well. So these are the things that people talk to me. And I've also recently, a uh, US think tank has, uh, who has, has come to me and actually presented to pretty distinguished guests. I, I would probably not talk about who they are, but because it was very closed door. Uh, I actually wake up in the middle of the night, but I was being asked about what I think about uh, the Taiwan situation, mm. how the China thing is. So if I would think about today, where my actual positioning, what my audience is, is I'm probably a person who facilitates um, the perspective of telling the story from an Asian point of view. Mm. So the reason why they come to me is not because they want to hear the same old narrative from the Americans, you know, their analysts, how they think of the Asian market. They want someone who is fairly neutral. Singapore, very lucky. We're right in the center of everyone. So they wanted someone who would tell them, no, I think maybe your perspective thinking about Taiwan is not accurate. This is the way we think about it. Mm. And we are neutral about it. How do we think of China uh, growth, influence in the region? This is how we think about it, not how you think about it. Mm. yeah so I think when you establish that perception and that's how I know who my audience really are then it becomes the methods of even thinking about monetization has to be more deliberate because it's your it's very very difficult to uh, 
to monetize this group of audience unless you have a very, very clear idea what is it that they require? What, what is the thing that they listen to you that makes sense? Mm. I, I hope that for a lot of people out there, they are wondering, but why the hell did you didn't want to monetize? It's not that I don't want to. It's, I think the question is that you need to understand your, your audience a lot. And besides, it's a side project. So, <laughs> you know, the amount of effort that I spent on my work and even thinking about this podcast, uh, I've been told Charles in his podcast saying that I'm, this is like my fourth child. I need to figure out what to do with it at some point. And there's you there's this break point that I like two uh times that I'm going to think about uh as my inflection point. One is at episode five hundred, and the other if episode five hundred survives and I still go through them, the next break point is episode five one thousand. So, so it's like so the the question of about thinking about your audience is pretty important. Mm. And I think over the years I have built out that audience and I know who that audience is and. One interesting thing that the that's I'm pretty lucky uh, that I actually got out most of the regional executives, like the Scott Beaumont from Google, your Daniel Rhee from Facebook. They do they're not known to the US market, but they are the decision makers in APAC. Mm. I probably got most of them. I think Paul Merritt from SAP, Mitch Young from ServiceNow, Harish from Autodesk. But these people spent an hour with me and I'm probably one of the few who could get shy to come to my podcast and do a review on China every year for the last five years in the running. It's because it, it tells you that there's a lot of deliberation on my end to, to keep maintain the quality. Mm -hmm. uh, what people don't know is that I can do not, I do not want to publish anything if it's not good enough. So there is that uh, tension of trying to get a high quality product first get it right, get the right audience. Um, I, for right or for wrong, when people think of my podcast as the standard, I'm very honored, but I don't think I'm there. Because once I start thinking about the quiets out there, the founders podcast out there, the uh, the Kara Swishers, the Tim Ferriss, or even Jason Calacanis, for, for that matter, or Gary Vee for, as well, then your perspective changed. The market is actually much, much bigger than that. Mm. Yeah. It's a, yeah, big one. I used to do a little bit of work with the best like the best doing their transcripts and some backs. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he throws away like a third of episodes maybe. Like it's pretty crazy. Like... Yeah, but they had a business model, right? Because uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy is in the investment business, mm. right? And I do retail crypto trading. I, I definitely make a lot more doing crypto trading. And that's how I pay for my the bills of my team around me. But the question then is you're in a down market as well. So you need to start thinking about monetization properly yeah. as well. But the the money is not that it's not well spent. It's well spent because we are maintaining the quality of the podcast. And that's why the growth is accelerating. Mm -hmm. um, so if I were to dial it back and say, okay, I think we all have the same set of problems. What can we do as Asian podcast? So the one thing we never do very well, and I am going to say this, Oh, I said it in every Asian podcast, but I, I think no one seems to have understood this, is that in the US podcast, there's advantage of network effects. If so-and-so, let's say Elon Musk appeared in one podcast and he goes to the next podcast, the incremental effect for all of the podcasts is that there's a rise of all boats, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a rising of tightly of all boats. We don't have that effect at all because I can tell you, I study your audience, I study everyone's audience, our audience are all very disjointed. Maybe we have some commonalities like Johnny from Asian Norm Tree, uh, Tim Romero from Disrupting Japan, but we don't have a very clear um, way of creating that amplification effect. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the challenges that we see in this region. And I think this is something that needs to happen first so that we get enough network effects. And then I think we should be able to have a local advertising network. The problem with also the local advertising network is that they are VC back and they need to run a business immediately. Mm -hmm. I'd rather they bootstrap first, figure out what we really need, than trying to sign in the advertisers, but then couldn't justify why we cost this amount for them to advertise. Yeah. <laughs> because um, the unit economics doesn't work. Yeah. I'm very conscious of your time today as well. Sorry. Um, is I, there can, any... I can stretch a little bit if you want to. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Because I'm on Lyft today. Oh, yeah. So, so, it's easy. So, um, yeah. let me, like, hmm, let me read. Anything else, like, we haven't covered to that you still want to talk about? Mm. Or? I think I think the, a couple of things, right? So, I think we talk about the monetization. We talk about the distribution. I think the other thing that is pretty interesting to um, talk about is where do I find the time to do all these interviews? So, to tell my the audience out there, I do it at 9 to 10 p.m. Wow. At night. Most of my podcasts are done in the night. Uh-oh. So that it doesn't interrupt my official working hours. Yeah. Okay. So there's, so there's something nobody knows about that. And the guests um, are happy to do that too. That's crazy. Yep. I forced some of the guests to agree to my timetable. I think the other thing that I'm beginning to be a little bit more conscious of is... Um, so there's a rule in Analyze Asia that actually allow because the podcast is edited. So during the course of the interview, if my guest said something that he or she shouldn't have on the spot after the recording ends, he or she can say, hey, I need this to be edited. It'll be deleted. No questions asked. I don't even store it in the video. The video goes into the trash bin and deleted forever. However, I, I've taken this rule because it facilitates me to push publication very, very quickly. It gives mm-hmm. me that flexibility. But not from the top companies, but from what I call middle tier or maybe uh, PR firms as well. And I've blacklisted one or two of them now. Okay. They started challenging me to get a copy of the edited audio where the rules of engagement has already been set mm. at the start. So I don't know whether is it the PR firms having like, maybe somebody should challenge Bernard and test his patience on that. But every time I wrote back, this is my red line. Mm. Yeah. And I always tell them if Google, Meta, and South China Morning Post have no problems doing this, I don't see why you have a problem. So it becomes an issue. I would give advice out there. If you are a cop- comms person, don't rely on your PR firm. Just engage me direct. In fact, the best interviews I have with Scott, with Dan, with Paul, every or even Mitch, is all done through direct engagement. There is no PR firm in the middle because the rest, the game theory of it, and let me explain again here and to them. I am a senior executive myself. I have no interest in embarrassing anyone in my podcast because I'm not an American journalist who's looking to get a quick buck. What I'm here to interest, interested to do is to listen to their point of view, let them tell their own stories, and I'll ask questions about it and let the audience make a decision whether this is PR or whether there is some depth to the conversation itself. I think podcasters have to understand this. We are conduits we tell a story in a way we interview that's like you compounding curiosity for, for that matter right mm-hmm. we are also curious people we are trying to learn we're not trying to uh these our side projects we are not here for 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 fun or etc even i think even the way how the pr firms work in this part of the world is so traditional that it's like it's backdated to the 1980s mm-hmm where the Americans are really showing you, you can do TikTok influencer, you can make a bit of a blip, sometimes turn the blip into a, into a PR move, right? Uh, good news or bad news is better than no news, right? But it's not the way they think about it. And I think they do not advise their clients very well in that aspect. And I think they do not see the podcast medium as a right medium for itself. So I think that is where I would say these are the things that I don't talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also very thankful that because I started podcast very, very early, 2008, uh, with an earlier podcast, I had and also had a media outlet that was acquired by Tech in Asia. Um, so I was pretty fortunate that a lot of the journalists that I know uh, be, were na- are now very important people in the market. And hence, that's why I could get access to so many of them. So that's also... Uh, the network effects. It's, it's about compounding that network effect that I'm thankful for. I never see it as uh, entitlement or et cetera. I thank their support over the years when they come on the show and I actually never get a chance to even express that gratitude to them and friends who, who are now uh, important influencers as well. So I think I'll take this chance here to talk about that in, yeah. in, to express my gratitude to all the guests that have come on the show as well. 
Perfect. I, yeah, I have such a similar view. Like, I want to have fun. I want my guests to have fun. I want to make this as easy as possible. Um, so in the spirit of that, selfishly for me, how has mm. your podcast been experience been with me? Or what would you say things people can improve upon easily in terms of either booking or scheduling or questions? Um, yeah, how do you view it, maybe? I think it was pretty smooth, right? I think the the, the best time was, I think I was asking, what's the outline questions going to look like? And then we, we pretty much work on the Google Docs because we were using similar workflows. Yep. As I try, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to help out some of the questions there. And then here are some of the things I think we can discuss. And I came in to share a lot more also because I'm also thinking uh, while agreeing to doing this interview because I, I didn't thought about accepting any requests for for the for this month. I was actually write, starting to write a proper blog post called The State of Analyzation in 2022, which I'm going to publish in the next two days, okay? I'll send you the link on that. Uh, Talking a lot about the traffic, talking about the current plans and the future plans um, to be more methodical. Mm -hmm. So I think think in terms of where, how your podcast is, we will know when we hear the final product and when you can ask uh, your audience out there who have listened to it, is it good at all? Uh, whether there are people who, who learn something from this podcast, I think that will be the that will be the real testament of uh, our interview here because I don't do a lot of interviews uh, in in this part of the world, but partially it's not because I don't have have uh, I don't have the capacity I, I don't have the time to do mm-hmm. it because of family because of work as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm extremely grateful for having you on because I've learned a ton and I think this is really up my podcast game as well. So incredibly grateful. Um, thank you so much. Anything else you want to cover today before I let you go? Mm. So you want to have an advice for your uh, life experience university age students? I actually only have one very basic advice. It's in 12 words. Learn from everyone. Follow no one. Observe the patterns and work like hell. Love it. Perfect way to finish. Bernard, thank you so much for coming on today. I've had a blast. Mm. Thank you very much for having me on and look forward to speak again soon.